Ebola infectious deadly viruses like malaria, Zika, and Ebola spread. Using innovative medical and genetics research, Harvard computational biologist Dr. Paradis Sabati is trying to find out. What I'm about to tell you may seem difficult to understand, but she'll break down the science for us in layman's terms. Dr. Sabati and her lab team have invented algorithms to better understand how infectious diseases adapt and spread. Now, why is that important? Well, because hopefully this knowledge can lead to ways to prevent the disease and slow its spread. In 2014, when the Ebola epidemic began in West Africa, Sabati and her team were able to quickly determine the virus was spreading from person to person, not from mosquito bites. Now the research ended up saving lives. Dr. Sabati is also an associate professor at Harvard University. And if that isn't enough, she's also the lead singer for the rock band Thousand Days. And the band just released a new EP. Joining us from Boston to tell us more about our groundbreaking research is Dr. Paradis Sabati. Welcome to Full Frame. Well, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So uh, you use computational methods and you study genomes. And just saying that short little bit is enough to have people's eyes glaze over, as I'm sure you know, because it just seems like uh, I'm talking in such a way that, that it's already way over most people's heads. But it's, is it that complicated? I mean, how do you break it down so that uh, lay people understand all of this? Yeah, so, um, well, uh, everyone in our bodies, we have uh, genomes, and uh, every organism on Earth has a genome, which is, it's kind of, in its simplest form, a, a string of letters that is the blueprint. It encodes everything that makes up us. Um, and the extraordinary thing is, with modern technology, we can, we can read out those blueprints for many individuals and many organisms on Earth, um, which uh, makes it so that, um, you start to think about nature as mathematical information. You get this, this sort of code and you have to decipher it. And I use computers and mathematics to decipher what's going on in the code. Um, and so for, for me, it's actually a really extraordinary time uh, in, in research to be able to have that information and mine it. Um, so we just use math, statistics, different kinds of methods to, to look through these millions, billions of letters and try to figure out uh, you know, how to make sense of it. You used the word extraordinary, and I think there's an extraordinary story about Ebola that somehow uh, journalists miss, because as I was watching you talk about what was going on uh, in Kenema and Sierra Leone, you've got a staff there dealing with, with this crisis, and yet I think most people miss that in Boston, you and others were working around the clock trying to really kind of break the code in a sense. Uh, talk to me about that time, because it was a heady time for you, so much riding on what you were doing. Um, what was that like? Um, yeah, so this was in uh, 2014, and it was that spring of 2014 when uh, the Ebola outbreak was first declared in, uh, in Guinea. And um, and we, we are, our teams, we had teams in Sierra Leone and Nigeria, and they're both places where we were doing work with other deadly viruses. We recognized if the viruses came into those countries, we'd have to be the first line of defense. So we set up diagnostics in, in, uh, in our sites there, and soon after, you know, uh, unfortunately diagnosed these first cases in those countries. It was an extraordinary time. Um, you know, at that point, the international community had not really recognized uh, what a crisis this was, and there was not staff, there was not teams uh, to support it. All of the, um, the, the, the major players had already been tapped out in Guinea, and by the time it got to Liberia, there weren't resources. And so we were really doing everything we could to try to get attention. So we were, I was in D.C. many times, you know, banging on doors, getting, trying to get more support um, for the outbreak response. Um, but we, we could do one thing. We're a research lab. We do genomic work. And so we already had a, 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 a long-standing relationship where we were sending uh, samples to the United States and we would sequence them. Um, and so we, we immediately just you know, sent uh, shipments out. And while our teams were working in country, we were working in the States doing ship work around the clock, re uh, generating the data from the viral sequence and releasing it to the web. And I, one of the reasons why we released it immediately and publicly is we were, we were doing everything we could to try to get attention uh, to bring it to the cause, and uh, and I think our phone calls and our pleas were not were not enough. And we thought that if we actually start generating the data, letting people see what was going on, that this virus is transmitting. You know, as we started getting the data, it was transmitting from human to human. That it, that uh, these RNA viruses they mutate very quickly. Uh, that these are the kinds of things that were able to start to you know ring the alarms to bring attention to the cause. 
And, uh, you know, if you just kind of walk us through this uh, just a little bit, because I think uh, what people don't understand is when you do this sort of research, then you, you go, you publish, and it's a long process. And yet you wanted to push that information out there. It wasn't all about the glory of look at what we've discovered. It was about we've got to get the information out there. Talk to me about making that decision and why that was so important. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, th I think that there is, um, in the world of academia, but also in industry, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of individuals working in silos. There's, there's this sort of things that they're trying to protect, their, their stake, the claim, the glory, all of these things are things that people are thinking about all the time. Uh, but for us, uh, it was just never about that. I remember it actually, there was, you know, one of my students was the, the, was the lead author, the, the driver on this, and I, I came to him and I said, look, we got to get this data out. Um, and, and frankly, it, you know, if I don't get a major publication, if this is just published on the archive on the web, um, I would be happy. Would you be happy? And he said, absolutely. And we, we just decided right then and there that the best thing we could do and the most important thing we could do is to bring the whole world in as fast as possible. And so it was, it's just a very different thing when you're thinking about individuals on the front lines and you're trying everything you can to help them and the attention isn't there. I mean, that was our focus. And so for us, the decision was natural. Um, and, uh, and we hope that that becomes, you know, uh, something that's, uh, it's now being talked about, but, but we really want it to come to action. That in an outbreak, uh, we don't have time, we don't have the luxury of time, and it's really important. The best thing you can do is to get the data out there as soon as possible. Let me talk to you about your community, because I think uh, when we think about uh, an outbreak like this, an epidemic, we think numbers. This many people died in this country, this many people, uh, they're figures. but. For the numbers, there are also names, and for the figures, there are faces, and you know those faces, and you know those names. Uh, colleagues of yours died because of this epidemic. Can you put a face on this epidemic for us? Just tell us maybe a story or two about some of the people that touched your lives that you had slip away because of this terrible disease. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I, would, I would love to. I, I don't think I can do them justice here, and I, and I wish you could see them yourself. Um, I have... Uh, but in essence, um, we did the, we lost many people at Kenema, the hospital we work with in Sierra Leone, um, and many beyond. Hundreds of healthcare workers lost their lives. One particular one I often talk about is Dr. Khan, um, who is the head physician at the ward um, that we uh, work at in Sierra Leone. He was an expert on loss of fever. He's a hero. He's somebody who, uh, you know, knew the risks of the work he uh, was taking on, but uh, but was so driven, so passionate. Um, and he and a number of the nurses lost their lives. They were there by themselves. This was early in the outbreak in Sierra Leone, um, but when you know when other uh, places were tapped out, they were they were getting cases coming from ac across the country, hundreds of cases coming in with a single doctor um, working, and uh, and fundamentally they were very very safe. But at a certain point, um, when the cases started to explode, uh, they became infected and they passed. And it, well, the tragedy is, uh, you know, they, they did it in, in, you know, where one of the main explosions happened. It was when one of the other nurses at another part of the hospital was having a, uh, she was having a miscarriage. And it was, um, it, it was clear she probably had Ebola, clear she would die, but they wanted to make sure they could help her. And there was uh, a lot of blood and a, and a number of them became infected. And to me, actually, like, it's, it's, it's extraordinary, like what these people sacrifice for each other, and and the kind of heroism that you see in these uh, these incidents, and and so for me, like particularly when you start talking about people thinking about, uh, you know, what they can get out of it and how to protect data and, and all these kinds of things, I just I I do get really upset because, and I do get really sort of empowered that we there are individuals out there that basically sacrificed for us for each other. For the world until the very last moment, um, and so it's on all of us uh, to to do the same. To be with, I, I say that I wrote a song about it, and basically it talks about how I'm in this fight with you always, and these individuals were in this fight with us always to the very end, and I think that it's really critical that we're in this fight with them always, and that we show that kind of bravery and heroism in our lives, just an inkling of it that they showed. 
Ebola obviously is top of mind for so many people because of what happened, but uh, you also focus on the loss of virus. And can you talk to us about just how devastating that is and perhaps maybe even a little bit about the fact that maybe it's not as top of mind, but it should be? Absolutely, yeah. So loss of virus is not as well known, but it is something that's really devastating and quite widespread. It's actually a biosafety level four virus, just like Ebola causes hemorrhage, can have extraordinary high fatality rates, and it's actually pretty widespread in West Africa, uh, common in Nigeria, common in Sierra Leone. Um, and it's a disease more people should know about, uh, not just you know this, this small group of experts, but, but everyone should be paying attention to, because it also has these outbreaks that occur in different you know, you know, places in West Africa. It actually has more cases that have occurred outside of Africa than any other deadly uh, virus. Um, uh, over you know uh, cases actually that are, that have occurred even in the last years, um, it's it's something that we need to be paying a lot of attention to, um, uh, and that I'm very passionate about. And it infects thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people every uh, every year in West Africa. Okay, so thousand days. I think you should rename it to a uh, thousand hours because that's how many hours I'd need in a day to do all the stuff that you do, which I can't get, <laughs> wrap my arms around. I, here you are doing genome stuff, and yet you can still perform. So talk to me about music, what role it plays in your life, and also because you know I think a lot of people think if you're into science, that's like one part of your brain, and so you wouldn't like be into music. I mean, most people think, you know, they, you talked about silos, people put people in silos when it comes to that. How is music important in your life? And, and talk to me a little bit more about the band. Sure, um, yeah, so music is critical in my life. Uh, I often talk about a, a story about how when I, um, uh, you know, when I first went to Nigeria, on one of my first visits there, studying this deadly virus, Lassa virus, uh, I kind of was woken up in the morning to hear the, uh, all of the staff at the, at the hotel that we were staying at singing, and it was the most glorious thing I'd ever heard, um, and uh, was just sort of completely moved by it and, and went into the lobby to see they had all gathered and began to sing. Uh, and then I went to the, the clinic, and they were doing the same uh, at, at, you know, at the in the diagnostic lab at the hospital and uh, was just amazed that, you know, they gather every morning and they sing to start the day and they sort of, um, you know, give thanks um, and begin. And it's ex extraordinary. Um, and I think that for, for me, that was really powerful. I was, I was in a rock band before, so I've been doing music for some time, but it's the sense that in essence, like, that they are connected through this shared humanity. And then, and, you know, then they start these really challenging days um, on the front lines of these devastating diseases, but they, they're always connecting. And to me, actually, music is that form of connection. Um, and it's a, it's a really different and powerful way that I've, I've done that with them. So for the last many years, in addition to doing rock music, I've been doing this music with these Nigerian um, and other West African uh, uh, scientists that I work with. And we just released an album that's um, songs uh, from that period of time. It's kind of a, um, uh, an extraordinary thing, the way that um, music can just come to you in parts of your life where you're really, uh, some of your darkest moments and, and make something still sad, but sort of, you know, to you beautiful out of it. Um, and so I, I, the kind of work that I do is, is hard, it's challenging, and it, it has a lot of uh, devastation to it. Um, and I, I think that the music is um, what helps me get through it. Dr. Sabati, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We'll be right back with a look at the revival of a unique art form here in the United States.